Okay, we can uh, start uh, with uh, the course about dark matter. We have uh, Francesco Dermo from uh, University of Padua. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here giving four lectures on uh, dark matter. So that's the... That's the topic of my four lectures, and as you have already seen this morning, it will be a big player in this school. We already heard about dark matter in, uh, in the first lecture on CMB. What I will be giving is more a perspective from the particle physics point of view, because it's more connected with my research. So as I said, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's actually the first time I got invited to a summer school, hopefully not the last. We'll see how, we, how it goes. And, uh, in this same room, it was also my first time as a student at the summer school uh, a few years ago. And uh, I have a very good uh, memory of that school. It was two fantastic weeks where I was just beginning doing research and uh, I learned a lot of useful things that they were useful for the rest of my days until, until today. So I hope this school, I'm sure this school will be as useful as it was for me, for you. And uh, I will do my best to give my contribution for this school to be useful for you. So I need your collaboration. Your collaboration is simple. Whenever I say something that is not clear, you interrupt me, and I try again. Okay, so as the first lecturer, Professor Komatsu said this morning, don't be shy. I may explain things not in a clear way. I may say wrong things. If you think I say something wrong, stop me, and we'll discuss about that. And uh, this is true in this uh, room, but it's true also outside of this room. I will actually be here, I will be teaching only the first week, but I will be here both weeks. And uh, so if you see me and you're curious about uh, something I discuss in the lectures or something I do for, for research, just stop me anytime and talk to me. I will be very happy, okay? Uh, so I think uh, we are done with the introduction, so we start and uh, to put this lecture series in a broad context, I would like to start from a question. Okay, so this is the question that we try to answer every day in our, in, in our research. So that's what we want to know. We want to know what the universe is made of. And uh, by the way, is this size big enough for everybody? People in the back can read, otherwise I can magnify. Okay. So that's what we want to know, and uh, I'm not the first one asking this question. Uh, we have evidence that more than 2,000 years ago, people in Greece were asking the very same question, and they actually came to an answer that it was very close to be right, namely the atomic theory of, uh, of Democritus. Very close to be right because we actually learned that atoms are not indivisible, despite their name, that in Greek, atomos means something you cannot split. Uh, but what was amazing is that they never bothered to test their theoretical ideas. So they had this atomic theory, say this is my theory, it makes sense, it's beautiful, I'm happy. But that's not the way we do physics today. Okay? So the validation, the experimental validation, uh, by performing the experiment and checking if this theory is right or wrong, it's at the basics of the scientific method today. And so, Many centuries passed by until the, 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 the development of scientific method, but actually the atomic theory was validated experimentally only two centuries ago, more or less, okay? So the question is very old, but we started to come to quantitative answers only in the last 200 years, more or less. And then what we learned in the last century or so is that atoms, so okay, there are, atoms, but then we learn with the discovery of the, this was 1897 by J.J. Thompson, that the atoms, they actually have a structure, despite the name, as I said, because atomos in Greek means something you cannot split, but you can split the atom, and that's what Thompson did. Later on, we also learn about quarks, and this is very recent. 
This is very recent, and by recent I mean roughly 50 years ago. Okay, so 50 years ago, more or less, we learned that, we experimentally verified that the nucleons, the nuclei are made of nucleons, which are protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons have a structure. They're made of three quarks. They're a bound state of three quarks. And uh, that's what our resolution stops today. Okay, so as far as we know, quarks do not, do not have a structure, but it's only an experimental limitation. So we, in some sense, we succeeded in answering the question by Democritus because we know now what the building blocks are of the universe. And I emphasize here that Okay. Uh, I emphasize that what we know are the building blocks of the visible universe. So it doesn't come as a surprise. We already heard this morning that most of the universe is invisible. But let's stick to the visible universe. Now we have a very compact understanding of the visible universe. So everything we can see from this chair to this table to us, to this building, the planets, the stars, including the sun, the galaxy, the, the luminous part of the galaxy, they are made of the same building blocks. And these blocks are quarks and leptons. Okay, so quarks are, there are actually six quarks in nature, but the two lightest ones are the ones that bind together to form neutrons and protons. Leptons, it's another class of particles uh, like the electron, like the neutrinos, and heavier cosines of the electron, like the muons and the taus. Uh, so as scientists, we would not be satisfied with just this answer. So what is the building block? And then you give me a list of building blocks. It's not really what uh, the answer, the question was about. We didn't want a list. We also wanted to understand the principles according to which these building blocks interact with each other, okay? And so this is very nicely summarized by the standard model of particle physics. So in the rest of my lectures, sometimes I will refer to the standard model. SM stands for the standard model. And the standard model explains in a very compact way the interactions among these building blocks. Okay? So we know, sorry? The gluons? No, I mean, even the photons and the Z, but this is matter and the interactions are coming here. Oh, okay, 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 no, but the valence quarks, I didn't mind valence quarks. Yeah, but gluons are what kept the proton bound together, but the quarks bound inside the, the proton. Um, so, uh, we know these are matter fields, we know the way they interact, there are strong interactions, and electro weak interactions, so strong interactions are precisely what uh, was just pointed out that in the protons and the neutrons, quarks are bound by gluons, that are the mediators of the strong force. Electroweak interactions are what we see today as two separate things, weak interactions responsible for beta decays, and electromagnetic interactions, which is what, why you can see me with lights, okay. And uh, now we know that they are just a low energy manifestation of the same theory, the electroweak theory. And this is, by the way, why Abdul Salam with Weinberg and Glash have got the Nobel Prize for developing the electroweak weak unified theory. Uh, there is, of course, also gravity. We also know that this particle inter interacts gravitationally uh, in a way described by general relativity, GR. And uh, I'm missing one particle here, which I'm sure you have heard, which is the Higgs boson, okay? So the Higgs boson is, I'm sure you heard in the news six years ago by now, it was the last missing piece of the standard model, missing piece experimentally, okay? We knew he had to, well, no, we didn't know that, but the theory was developed with the Higgs boson, but as I said before, it's very important to experimentally test our theoretical ideas, and finally the Higgs boson was found. 
So the standard model now is a complete description of the visible universe. It tells us what are the building blocks, how they interact with each other. So these are fermions, these are mediator particles are bosons. The X boson is also a boson. And uh, it's a very elegant and comp compact description. So if you go to the GIF store I saw this morning, they, they sell t-shirts with everything you need to know about the standard model. So from everything is in that t-shirt, you can compute probability amplitudes for this fundamental degrees of freedom to interact with each other, okay? So it's a very elegant description of the visible universe, and it's also very robust and working very well, because we have been testing the standard model at colliders in the last 40 years, at least, if not 50 by now, and we found at collider no deviation from the standard model. So we are happy, but not completely happy, for the reasons I'm about to say. So we are happy because we have a very good understanding of the visible universe. We know how to describe interactions uh, between these uh, modes. But there are convincing reasons to think that the standard model is not the final theory of nature, it's not the fundamental theory of nature. And uh, the reason is that there are many phenomena, and I will describe some of them, or many conceptual points that we don't quite understand well or we cannot reproduce well within the standard model alone. Okay, so when I say BSM, I mean physics beyond the standard model. So as I said, there is more than one motivation. For example, there is the hierarchy problem, there is the strong CP problem, why strong interaction do not violate CP to a very good accuracy. Uh, there is a problem of baryogenesis. How do we end up today with just baryons and not antibaryons? There is a problem of neutrino masses. Why neutrino masses are what they are? The standard model alone predicts zero neutrino masses, at least at the randomizable level, okay? And uh, there is dark energy that you will uh, see a lot in this school, and I will not be talking about dark energy, but a very robust, and it's not the only reason to be convinced that there must be physics, beyond, it's not the only one, but a very robust evidence for physics beyond the standard model is the observed abundance of dark matter. So this, I say it's very robust because this is not about explaining small numbers like it could be for the strong CP problem or for the hierarchy problem. This is something we know has to be there, but the standard model fails at providing a viable candidate, okay? So this is a big open question in the field of fundamental physics. It's the center of a lot of activity, both theoretical and experimental, because as I say, the two activities must go together. I'm a theorist, so I'm more on the uh, proposing ideas uh, part, but of course then every idea we propose has to be tested and has to be validated from the experiment. So it's a very active field, there are big open questions to, to answer, and uh, it's a chapter of the book of fundamental physics that it has to be entirely written, okay? So at the moment, we do not know the origin and composition of dark matter from a particle physics point of view. We know it's there, but we don't know what it's made of. And uh, so it's something good to work on, okay? And uh, let me remind you some uh, numbers that we already saw in the first lecture this morning. So in cosmology, it's uh, what we usually do, we give mass energy densities in terms of dimensionless ratios. So we define the energy density of one species I as the ratio between its energy density and the critical one. And uh, the critical density is defined this way. So H0 is the Hubble parameter that we saw this morning, 68 kilometer per second per megaparsec. G is the Newton constant that everybody should know from like classical, uh, from yeah, classical mechanics and 
gravity, Newtonian gravity. And uh, so if you plug the numbers and you express energy in GeV, this is a very common unit in particle physics to express energy and masses. They are the same because of E equal mc squared. You can express masses in GV as well. So the energy, the critical density is 10 to the minus 6 GV per centimeter cube. Okay, so an energy corresponding to the energy density, to just give you an idea, if you take a cubic centimeter in this, in this room, then there is 10 to the minus 6 GV. For comparison, a proton has a mass of 1 GV. Okay? It's a very small density. So you have, you have one millionth of a proton per centimeter cube. And uh, so let me give you some number. So we saw this morning that for baryons, and when I talk about baryons, I really mean everything that is in this blackboard. Okay? So most of the mass density today left over from the standard model is, in, is accounted for by, by baryons. So the energy density of baryons is 5%. So this morning I think we saw like 4.7. So for comparison, the one for dark matter is 27%, okay? And the one for dark energy is 68%. So you see from this blackboard one of the reasons why we cannot be satisfied with the standard model alone. The reason is that we only understand 5% of the universe. Of the energy content of the universe, we only understand 5%. Okay? The rest is unknown. We know it has to be divided between 27% dark matter, 68% dark energy, but it's, uh, it's something we don't know. Okay? We don't know the origin and composition of 95% of the energy density of the universe. So if you sum this number, you get 1 or 100%. So the total energy density of the universe is very close to the critical one. So omega total is 1. But the contribution from stuff we know is only 5%. Okay, so that's what the big open problem is, is, is about. And uh, so the, the goal of this first lecture and then, as I said, I come from more from a particle physics perspective, so in the next lectures I will discuss about theoretical ideas and how to test them. But since I'm assuming that there is, no, at least on average, no previous exposure to, to the field, is to go through uh, a review of evidences for, for dark matter, how we became convinced that actually there is 25% of matter that doesn't shine and it cannot be belonging to this black hole. Okay, so that's the plan, and uh, let's start from one example that has nothing to do with dark matter, but it's, it gives you the idea of the techniques that are used to, to probe this, uh, this type of physics. Okay, so the, So here we are on a very small length scale. We are on the length scale of the solar system, okay? very small part compared to the universe. So in, in the 1840s, the planet Neptune was discovered. But I put this with that language because it was not really seen, Neptune. So what astronomer did was They carefully, carefully studied the motion of Uranus. Okay, so Uranus is the planet that going from the sun outside of the solar system, it's the one before Neptune. Okay, so it's closer to us, so it was easier for us to observe that. And they found mismatch. A mismatch be between the theoretical prediction of the orbit of Uranus and the observation. 
what they actually saw in the sky. Okay, so a uh, few words about the theoretical prediction. Well, we should know very well, this was in 1840s, so all you need to describe the motion of a planet, all you need is this two equation, f equal ma, vectors, and then the force between two massive objects, okay? So the way the theoretical prediction was performed was to exactly compute F, the total F acting on the planet, based on all the forces that they were acting on the planet. Assuming that the only bodies attracting the planet were the ones we could see, okay? So from the mismatch between this theoretical prediction and observation, they concluded that they could infer the presence of some other celestial body that was dark at the time, okay? So in the 1840s, Neptune was some form of dark matter, in quotes, okay? Because it was something that we knew it was there by studying the motion of visible objects, but we didn't see it. Then later on, of course, our astronomers got better, they could observe Neptune, and now we know that Neptune belongs to this blackboard. Okay, Neptune is made of stuff we know. But the techniques is very similar. So you see something that moves, you know that it moves under the influence of gravity, you make a prediction for the motion you expect, you compare with observations, if you find that it doesn't correspond to the observation, then there must be something else pulling that object, okay? Okay, so now this was one example that had nothing to do with dark matter, but it was, uh, it was a good illustration of the basic idea, okay? Okay. Now, the first time that some invisible mass was pointed out was by Zwicky. around, so almost 100 years ago, so not even 100 years ago. And uh, Zwicky was a Swiss astronomer that observed the coma cluster. So it was a system that was a bound state of galaxies, gravitationally bound among each other. And by the way, if you sit in a dark matter talk, it's very, maybe more for colloquium, physics colloquium, it's very common that the speaker starts the discussion with a funny picture of Zeke doing the okay sign and very strange face. So that, that's why, because he was the first person that pointed out the, some missing mass, some missing invisible mass in the universe. So, okay. And this is more important historically, okay? So it was not a conclusive evidence. It was not taken seriously for many decades, but since we're doing a review, let's just go through history and there is still some useful lesson to learn from this. Okay, so, comma cluster. So as I said, a cluster of galaxies many of them, like hundreds, thousands of galaxies, gravitationally bound among each other. So what did he do? He measured the speed, the velocity of these galaxies moving within the cluster, and he found that the galaxies were they were moving too fast, okay? So you look at these galaxies, he measured the velocity, they were moving very fast, too fast. But too fast, what, what does it mean, too fast? So, too fast with respect to what? Okay. So again, here, the story is about the comparison between a theoretical prediction and uh, an astronomical observation, okay? 
So how did he predict the typical velocity of the clusters, of the galaxies within the cluster? So for a system like the coma cluster, there is a There is a result known as the virial theorem, and the virial theorem connects the average kinetic energy, K, and the average potential energy, V, of the system, total energy of the system. So this is not only valid for, uh, for gravitational forces, it's valid for every force that goes like one over R squared, like the one I, I wrote there. And it's also valid for other forces. The, there are different coefficients, but let's focus on gravitational forces. Okay, Q times the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is zero. Okay, so all we have to do now is to compute the kinetic energy, the potential energy, compare them, and see if the Virial theorem agrees with the observations. Okay. So the kinetic energy the kinetic energy is computed as the sum of the individual kinetic energy of each galaxy. So it's just one half sum over i m i v i square. Okay? So the index i runs over the galaxies. So I said there are like hundreds or thousands of them. And for each one, we have a mass and we have a velocity. Now, we want to go through a qualitative argument, okay, without going to, into too many details. So let's assume that actually VI, more or less the typical, these are average quantities. The real theorem uh, holds for average quantities, okay? So let's assume, which is actually a very good approximation, that the average velocity of each galaxy it's the same, okay? So this vi doesn't depend on i. I can take it out of the sum. I'm still left with the sum over the mass, but this is just the total mass of the cluster, okay? So the kinetic energy of the cluster is approximately given by one half the mass times the typical velocity square of each galaxy. So the way we compute the Potential energy without the minus, without the square. So you sum over all the different pairs of galaxies. That's why there is i less than j to avoid double counting. And then you sum over the potential energy of each pair of galaxies. So there is a, let me check the number, five over three, yes. So if these galaxies are distributed uniformly on a sphere, then this is something you can check. The gravitational potential energy is five over three, it's negative of course because it's a bound system, it's minus five over three, mass square of the cluster over the radius of the sphere. Okay, so this is just the potential energy of a uniform sphere. Okay, so now all we have to do is to compare and use the virial theorem. So QK plus V is M comma V square plus three, no, uh, minus, because I have a plus here, but V is negative, so I need to put a minus minus five over three, and this is zero, okay? Virial theorem. So now we solve for V square, and I mean these are just approximate results, but uh, they give us a feeling of the order of magnitude This is the final answer, okay? So 
what you can do and what actually Zwicky did was to measure V. You can see how fast the galaxies are moving. And then you can also measure M. How do you measure M? You assume that all mass comes from the stuff you can see. Okay? So you can see these galaxies. You detect some given luminosity. You use some mass to ratio, mass to luminosity ratio. And then you compare. You compare and ask yourself, do they satisfy the VL theorem? And what Zwicky found is that this was bigger than this. Okay? So the result Zwicky found was that V square was too large with respect to the expectation from the viral theorem. Okay? So he concluded that there must be some form of in B. Actually, he was the one that invented the name dark matter. It was Zwicky. It was in German. I don't know how to say that in German, but the translation is uh, dark matter. And uh, for the first time, there was some serious evidence that there was some form of invisible mass in the universe. Now, this was not taken, this, we are now in the 30s, okay? We are in the 30s. This was not taken very seriously, okay? And uh, so, I mean, of course, I wasn't there. I don't know why it was not taken seriously, but I can tell you when the evidence for dark matter was actually taken seriously. And that was in the 70s, 19... 70s, this is, yes, yes, ask questions please. So this is a, it's just an approximation. Now, in, if you have a uniform sphere with constant density of mass, you can compute just by using classical mechanics. I think it's just three by five. Oh, three by five. Oh, oh, it may be. It may be. Okay, I can check this because I have the. Uh, three by five. Yes, yes. Thanks, thanks, thanks. 3 by 5, so here it becomes 3 by 5. Yeah, so as you, as you just saw, I make mistakes, so interrupt me. Uh, okay, other mistakes? So I... I think, uh, if I remember correctly, I can tell you the number, like how much extra mass you needed, okay? So, uh, which is how large was compared to, to K. So I think it was between 10 and 100, the mass, if I remember the number correctly. So, Yeah, 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 no. Without changing the potential, without changing Newtonian gravity. Or, or, or you are saying if you modify gravity. Yeah, at that point of time, maybe it's that sort of thing. So I wasn't born in the 30s, so I don't know. But uh, uh, it was just a single evidence, and uh, the observations were not so accurate, as accurate as the one I'm about to say. So I think. Uh, it was, it was tough to convince people, but I wasn't around, so I don't know. Um, okay, so three over five, very good. Um, now, let's go to the 70s. Yes? So this is, yes, yes, so the question is, how do we know that the coma cluster is virilized? Okay, so we can roughly measure the and I'm not an astronomer, so I'm 
take my answer with a grain of salt, okay? It's enough long lived that there was time to, so when you prove the virial theorem, you take the average of the kinetic energy of V, and then there is some quantity. So this is not zero in general, but when you take the average over a long amount of time, it goes to zero. Okay, so the answer is that he had enough time to realize, and we can compute that. Oh, yeah, okay, the yeah. The emission is there only when gas gets shock heated to very high temperature. This is only possible after the realization. Now we can actually see that. Plus, we can also estimate temperature from X ray gas. We can estimate mass from weak length. Yeah, yeah, so I, I will get to that, I will get to that too, so to the gas and to the, to the lens, yeah, yeah. But, okay. So, yeah, probably they didn't know in the 30s. That's, that's, I think it's fair to. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes. This, 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 this one? So, I don't even think this was the way that Zwicky did the estimate. I'm just doing a sketch to give you a feeling of what are the relevant physical quantities involved here. Okay, so this is not the case in the actual cluster. So if you look at Zwicky's paper, probably uh, this is not the way he did that. It's, it's just to say that the typical kinetic energy must, be, must scale as the total mass and the typical velocity, okay? But the actual calculation is more involved. Yes? Yes, there is also the gas, and uh, I will get to that with, in the modern days. So in 10 minutes, I will discuss also about the dark matter evidence we have from clusters today. So I will get to that. The velocity, I think, is from uh, the Doppler shift. So you detect uh, photons, and then you, you see how the spectra are shifted with respect to the ones we know and we measure in the labs, and that tells you about the velocity along the direction of observation. So from the Doppler effect, you can know how fast things are moving. Other questions? Good. We are doing very well. Very good. Okay, so rotation course. So this progress was uh, linked to a development in the radio astronomy. There was a significant improvement in the 70s. And we could measure, so now I will sketch again our galaxy. Actually, we, did a, we know now also the rotation curve of our galaxy, but imagine you look at some spiral galaxy in the sky Spiral as our galaxy, okay? And uh, what you want to do here is to measure, so, so let me get to the quantity we want to measure. V of R, the velocity of stars in the galaxy as a function of R, where R is the distance from the center, okay? So that's a well-defined question. I want to make a plot V of R as a function of R. And again, here there is a theoretical prediction, something I expect from my knowledge of physics, and then there is reality, what we observe. And in this case, it's different in a very convincing way, as we will see. Okay, so I prepare the plot without revealing the surprise, R, V of R, and uh, so what we expect is based on a calculation, again, without knowing too much fancy physics. F equal ma and F equal the Newton's law, okay? Newton's law. So F is G, okay. Uh, so this is the force. So if, if I look at a star here, okay? So this is a star in the galaxy. 
which is at a distance r from the center, the force that the star feels is proportional to g, it's proportional to the mass of the star, lowercase m, is proportional to the distance, and is proportional to the roughly, so this will be true actually only for a spherical distribution. Our galaxy is a disk, so we have to do the calculation. Again, this is just a qualitative sketch, but it gives you the feeling, okay? Then, if you want to do things properly, you have to take the distribution of a disk and compute the, the force. You get best self function. It's, it's not something that you can easily do on a blackboard, but the, the scaling is the same. So this is the force, and the force must be equal to m, a, m is again m, and a is v square of r over r, okay? So now you see immediately the m goes away, the mass of, as it should, okay, we know, we know that it goes away. Now you do some simplification, for example, you simplify the r here, you remove the square, and then you, you solve for v, which is what you want to measure, what you want to plot, so you, you solve v equal to something, and uh, let's see if I get this right, g m of r over r, okay? I just solve for v. Now, what is my theoretical expectation? So, our galax galaxies, spiral galaxy, uh, galaxies like ours, they shine up to five, 10 kiloparsec, okay? So we, we can see the luminous stuff up to five to 10. By the way, the solar system is eight kiloparsec away from the center. So we are really at the edge of the luminous part of our galaxy. But with these radio techniques, we can look at the very rare stars on the outskirts of the galaxy and we can get a rotation curve up to 200 kiloparsec, more or less, okay? So these numbers are important because now I want to give you a rough theoretical prediction. So of course, to make a proper theoretical prediction, we have to solve the equation of motion with the this distribution, do things properly, but with few simplifications, we can get at least the qualitative behavior. So inside the galaxy, so at radii much smaller than some critical radius, radius that I take roughly of the order of five kiloparsec, which is where the galaxy shines. So we are here and uh, we can assume that the matter is distributed with a uniform density inside the galaxy, okay? So if it's distributed with uniform density, the mass goes like R cube, it goes like the volume. So R cube over R is R square. I take the square root, I get R. So actually here, let me just put a proportional to, I don't care about prefactors, but I expect and if I measure the rotation curve very close to the center, I see a linear rise, okay? If I go far away, so at radii much bigger than the critical radius, then you see that basically the whole mass becomes a constant, okay? Most of matter is concentrated within the first 10 kiloparsec. So this M is a constant. If this M is a constant, then you expect, and this is crucial, at large radii, V of R dropping down as the square root of the inverse radius, okay? So this is also known as Keplerian decrease because it's in agreement with the third law of Kepler. And uh, I'm putting so much emphasis on the second result because that's where the trouble comes, okay? So let me draw the theoretical prediction. I use a dash line because I want to compare with the observation. 
So this is, and I emphasize again, this is just a sketch of the derivation. You can provide the theoretical prediction rigorously by solving the equation of motion with all the details. But roughly speaking, you expect a linear rise and then a decrease with the inverse square root of the radius. Now, what about observations? Observations show that you actually get it right here. But then the rotation curve is flat, okay? It's flat, how flat? Well, it's pretty flat as far as we can ma make measurements. So it stays flat all the way to, let's say, 200 kiloparsec, which is the, at some point we run out of stars. We cannot provide this rotation curve anymore. But. Okay, so in the 70s, this was, uh, uh, the first time I think the community got really excited about dark matter because it was not just one case. Many galaxies were uh, subject to this uh, type of uh, comparison, comparison between the observation and theoretical predictions, and they were all consistent. Actually, we're all inconsistent. And so again, here is an evidence of uh, the fact that if you want to reproduce this flat behavior, then, um, well, I would say at that point, the most conservative options was this. Nowadays, I think it's the only option, and I'll come to that, is to assume that within the galaxy, and our current understanding now is that the spiral galaxies are embedded in a spherical halo of dark matter, which provides another source for M, which we don't see, but we can infer it's there because of this behavior. Now, before anybody asks, I will answer the question. So one alternative option is to say, well, maybe the laws of gravity are the ones given by Newton's law as far as we can test here, okay? But maybe once you go all the way to the outskirts of galaxy, you are measuring the Newton's law. You are probing gravity at very large distance, and maybe the laws of gravity are different. So these are known as MOND, uh, Modified Newtonian Dynamics. So I think it's fair to say that for the galactic rotation curves, it's an option, uh, you may like it or not, but it may be a viable option to fit this curve, okay? I don't know much about how theoretical compelling is, but, uh, but I think it's fair, it's fair to say it can be an option. Now, I will, it's already noon, so I cannot go through all the evidences I wanted to, to show, but there are evidences, the one I'm going to talk about, that makes life for Mond really tough, if not impossible, okay? So adding one extra particle, massive particle, at this point, it's the most conservative option, and I also think it's the only one that can account for all the observations. Because since the 70s, now we are 2018, we have been collecting evidence for dark matter, not only on galactic scales, but also on scales of clusters, and on cosmological scales, as we are this morning, okay? And uh, everything comes together beautifully to a consistent picture with adding a new form of non-relativistic matter, massive new form of massive particles explains all the observation at different scales, okay? Okay, so let's see. Um, let's go to clusters, and then I will be brief on cosmological evidence because we have other lectures on uh, large-scale structure and CMB, like this morning where we will also see why we need dark matter to explain those observations. Okay. Okay, clusters. So, almost a century after Zwicky, we went back and looked at clusters, and now we have a more convincing evidence that dark matter also populates this, uh, this type of environment. So going back to the previous picture of a cluster, as was already mentioned before, 
inside the cluster, there are galaxies, and there is also gas, which is gravitationally bound to stay within the system, okay? And this gas emits X-ray, so it's typically ionized, so it emits photons through Bremsstrahlung, and uh, these X-ray emission scales like the number density square, okay? So by detecting these X-rays, we can measure the density of the gas as a function of the radius, and we can also measure the temperature of the gas from this spectra, thermal spectra of X-ray, okay? Now, another way to convince that there is some form of mass that we don't see within this environment is to study the hydrostatic equilibrium for this gas, okay? So hydrostatic equilibrium, so this is a P, If, uh, yes, so I use rho here. Okay, so there are two competing effects on the gas. Pressure, that wants the gas to expand and go away. And then there is gravity. Gravity tends to bring the gas back together. And these two, in, the system is in equilibrium, so these two effects must compensate each other and that's what's written in this equation. This is just F equal, F equal MA written in other form. So I say that we measure rho and T, but we don't measure the pressure. But that's just an extra step because we can use the equation of state for a perfect gas. And uh, actually the number density here, I'm making one approximation. I'm assuming that all the gas is made of protons, but you can actually also consider a multi-component gas. There is no problem. Now, if you plug this expression here, you get an equation relating temperature, uh, energy density, and the mass within a given radius, okay? So I say that we measure T, we measure rho from X-ray emissions, and we measure M through lensing, as was mentioned before. Again, here we found a mismatch between what we see and what we actually expect from this, this relation, okay? And, uh, well, sorry, what I meant is that actually the total mass we measure through lensing is consistent with this equation. I meant that the mass we see cannot be the whole mass, and so we infer the presence of extra mass. Okay, so since time is going very fast, let me mention uh, a couple of other things. So we have evidence of dark matter on the galactic scale. We observe many galaxies like ours, we have dark matter evidence on uh, the scale of cluster of galaxies. And now we also have we also have dark matter evidence on cosmological scales. So this is what we heard this morning about CMB. So here I can go fast because there are people more expert than me giving lectures in this school, so I will let them tell you why. Uh, why we think and uh, we are convinced that also on cosmological scale there must be this form of dark matter. So CMB is something we already heard this morning, but on Wednesday, I think we will see how the spectrum, the power spectrum we saw this morning, depends on the cosmological parameter, the density of the baryon, the density of the total matter. And we see that from CMB, what we derive is, 
omega baryon, omega matter, and uh, these two are different. Omega matter is six times bigger than the one in baryons, which means that there must be something else that cannot be baryons to explain CMB observation. Same story for this quantity that I call P of K. So P of K is the matter power spectrum, and I'm sure this will be discussed. We have two lecture series, one this week, one next week, on large-scale structure. So LSS, large-scale structure. So we will hear also why in order to reproduce the observation of this quantity with the theoretical prediction, we need something beyond just baryons. The prediction of a universe populated by only baryons is completely different. Uh, last thing I want to say, something very important. which is another very convincing evidence for the existence of, dark, existence of dark matter. And the evidence where theories like modified gravity are really troubles to account for, for the observation. Uh, so let me put it in. Dark matter is why we are here, OK? So without dark matter, we will not be here. Why? There is a very simple uh, estimate to come to this conclusion that can be done in Justice Blackboard, OK? So we heard this morning, and we know that the universe back in the days, back at very early times, was very hom homogeneous because we measure fluctuations in the CMB, as, as we heard this morning, really, really tiny fluctuation, 10 to the minus 5, OK? So as we will hear next week, we think now that this, uh, the seed for this fluctuation was inflation. Again, that's something for next week. But all I want to say now is that we know that at some point, even for the energy density of total matter, uh, this was more as we are this morning. It's reasonable to take this number up to order one factor to be really small. Okay, so this is the initial condition for the evolution of structure formation. And uh, our universe, the, the way we observe it now, is very nonlinear. Okay, so what I'm saying this is that here in our galaxy, so let me say Milky Way. Delta rho over rho is 10 to the 5. Okay? So our galaxy compared to the entire universe is a very dense region compared to the average. It's 10 to the 5 denser than the average. So how did we get from here to here? Okay? How did we get from a universe that was very homogeneous up to 10 to the minus 5, to a universe today where we are very inhomogeneous, very nonlinear. Nonlinear means that this ratio is not small. It's 10 to the 5, so we change the sign here. And the way we believe that happened is that these uh, fluctuations that were seeded by inflations evolved through gravitational, uh, under the influence of gravity, giving rise to the structures we observe today. But there is a problem if you don't put dark matter. The problem is the following, is that delta rho over rho um, if you solve the equation for the evolution of perturbation, it scales like the scale factor. Okay? So the universe expands, so A gets bigger with time. A is the same scale factor we saw this morning. And the growth of the perturbation is linear in the scale factor, OK? We also know that the last scattering surface, the one we saw this morning, corresponds to scattering surface over, 
So as we, as we saw today, the actual value of the scale factor is not something physical, but we can talk about ratios of scale factor. So the universe was smaller at the last scattering surface when CMB formed. And the scale factor was, say, 10 to the minus 3, more or less, the one of today. The universe was, it's a thousand times bigger today than at the time of uh, last scattering surface. So if, if there are only baryons, baryons, perturbations in the baryons, as we will hear, I'm sure, in great details in the school, but let me just tell you the, 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 the conclusion. In a baryon photon fluid, perturbation in baryons, that, so delta rho b over rho b, they cannot grow until the last scattering surface. Okay, this is why, because before the last scattering surface, the universe was, was ionized and the electrons were tightly coupled to photons through just Compton scattering and the perturbation just could not grow, okay? So if we assume that there is only baryon, the best we can do for delta rho over rho today is delta rho over rho at the last scattering surface time the ratio of the scale factors between these two moments, okay? And this factor, this ratio is 1,000. So in a universe with only baryons, we barely get to 10 to the minus 2 in the relative fluctuations, okay? So this is a problem because this will not explain why we have nonlinear structures today, okay? So this is one of the most striking, at least in my opinion, evidence for the need of something else. Okay. If you only have baryons, you never go nonlinear. Okay, uh, one more thing that is actually not very connected to dark matter, but it fits nicely within this picture, is uh, So Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, or BBN. So this is, unlike what I told you so far, is the great success of standard cosmology. So we can predict the abundance of some of the lightest elements that were synthesized, synthesized, synthesized in the early universe and compare them with observations, and we find an amazing agreement. And uh, all of these abundance, all of these abundances, more than one, they only depend on one number, the energy density in baryons, okay? And uh, BBN also gives a number consistent with CMB observations, okay? So, this fits within the picture in a nice way because it's an independent measurement of the energy density of baryons. And so we are very sure that the baryons are at most 5% of the total energy density. And we know that the total energy of matter is 32%, so we need something else. Uh, the reason why I want to mention this is also because of what I will tell you about tomorrow. So BBN, B, B, N, stars when the temperature of the universe is roughly one MeV, okay? And uh, just for completeness, the age of the universe is one second, okay? Then it continues for the first three minutes. There is a famous book by Steven Weinberg, the first three minutes, which describes how you form. Uh, these, uh, these light elements. And uh, the reason why I want to mention this value is because our success to extrapolate the history of the universe all the way to one MeV 
and getting these abundances right make us confident that we know the thermal history of the universe up to this value. Because as we heard this morning, a temperature higher than the last scattering surface, that 0.3 V. So at temperature about 0.3 V, there was no way, so there is no way for us to have direct access to the universe at higher temperature than this because of what we saw this morning. The photons were scattering a lot and uh, they don't come to us. They only come from the last scattering surface, okay? So to be 100% conservative, we can say we have a photograph of the universe only up to the last scattering surface, but our success with reproducing these uh, light element abundances made us confident that we actually know the history of the universe all the way up to one MeV. So this is important for what I'm going to talk about tomorrow because tomorrow we will move back in time to the early universe and I will tell you how the most popular dark matter models get, uh, get a successful uh, production in the early universe. And uh, there is always the assumption that we know what the universe looked like, looked like at very high temperatures and that we know the energy content. But to be very honest, I think we can say with confidence that we know the history only up to this number. I will repeat this tomorrow, but just as a preview. We don't know about the energy budget of the universe. We have no direct way, not even indirect way to know, about the energy budget of the universe above one MeV, okay? So in the last eight minutes, so is there any question? So I hope I convince you that dark matter exists. Yes. It could be, it could be, it could be. So tomorrow we will have a discussion about possible ways of producing uh, dark matter. One possibility is through the case of the inflaton. That's a way to populate the universe with dark matter. I don't know if we will discuss that tomorrow, but that's definitely a possibility. Okay. Yes? Uh, it's not a question, it's actually been rather recovered. Uh, maybe it's also worth uh, mentioning the light capacity. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So I, I was about to do that today because now in the last seven minutes, I will tell you what we definitely know about dark matter, and clusters are important because they give us a feeling of the self-interaction. So I, I will get there. I will try. Yes. And for the gas. So the equation of state for the equation of state for the gas. No, no, so the way it's done, it's in a proper way. So there are other elements. And you, the number density, you sum over all the, you have a, people have models of the gas also with different temperatures. So the estimate is done in a, this was just a sketch of what the basic idea is, but then. <coughs> yes, 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 yes. Is the evidence for, is still there. Questions? Okay. So in the last five minutes, the last five minutes, this blackboard is really big. Okay, in the last five minutes, I will tell you what uh, we, okay, so I hope I convince you that there must be some form of dark matter. So now, this is a good news, 
because we have something to work on? Well, they're all good news. The other good news is that we have no idea what it is, okay? So when you write a model or you build an experiment, how do you guide yourself, okay? If you really have no idea about the properties of this particle. So here I have a list of things that we know and whenever you build a model to explain dark matter, that then you can test the experiments, you have to make sure that you respect these uh, constraints if you want. So this is something we learn by looking at the sky and uh, these observations not only tell us that there must be dark matter, but they tell us something more. They tell us something about the properties of dark matter. So I want to conclude this first lecture with a list of these properties, and then tomorrow we discuss about more concrete models, okay? So density. Here I will go fast. Whenever you build a model, you want to make sure that you have omega dark matter 0. 27, okay? There is a precise number, so when you, when you actually write the paper, you, you are careful about these numbers, but that's a ballpark number. Then, what else do you want? You want to build a model where the particle is very stable, okay? Very stable. What does it mean, very stable? Very stable means that it has to be stable enough to be around today, because we observe it today in the universe. So at minimum, we want the, so if the particle is stable, period, then it's also very stable, because it's stable. But if you have some form of decaying dark matter, you have to make sure that it's enough long-lived that we still have it today. So the least you can ha ask is that the lifetime is longer than the age of the universe. This is the Hubble time. It's uh, 14 giga years. And it's also, if you convert to seconds, let's see if I get the number right. Yes, 10 to the 17 seconds, more or less. So this is the simplest thing you can say, but actually the limit is stronger. So this is not the real limit. The real limit depends on the decay channel. So if the dark matter decays visibly, by visibly I mean to electron, photons, then it's going to mess up the CMB, okay? So the actual lifetime, the limit is more severe. No, seconds. So it's much, the, the bound is actually much bigger than the Hubble uh, lifetime by 13 orders of magnitude, so it's, it's a very strong limit. Of course, if you assume that the decay products of dark matter are invisible, so nothing that is going to affect the CMB, then the bounce is, is more relaxed, but, but still, it's longer than the Hubble lifetime. It's 200 giga years. So the Hubble lifetime, the Hubble time was uh, 14. So it's one order of magnitude bigger than the, than the one from, uh, from Apple. Okay, what else? So I don't have time, I will focus on the main properties. This is very important. It has to be cold, okay? Sometimes you see acronyms like CDM, cold dark matter. So let's try to understand what cold means before we, before we go for lunch. So this means that when you have a dark matter model that you produce in some way in the early universe, there are multiple options, but you want to make sure that when the temperature of the universe is one kV, so remember BBN was one MeV, so here we're talking really about low temperature, it's between BBN and CMB formation, okay? The dark matter particle must be cold. So what does it mean cold? It must be that the equation of state for the dark matter particle 
has to be pressure equal zero to a very high degree of accuracy. Cold dark matter is identically zero, okay? Why? So this is a limit that comes from structure formation. And the one kV is the, it corresponds, so one kV, why this magic number? It's the size of the horizon, the commoving size of the horizon of the smallest structure we observe, okay? So if dark matter particles were hot at one kV, so if they were moving very fast, there is an effect called free streaming that will wash away perturbation on these scales and then we would not observe what we observe, okay? So whenever we build a model, we want to make sure that the one kV dark matter particles are not free streaming. By the way, small parenthesis, this is one of the reason, now not the only reason, this is why neutrino of the standard model cannot be dark matter, okay? They are hot. At one kV, they move very fast, so they would wash uh, structures out. Okay, so I, somebody mentioned clusters. There is no colliding cluster, sorry. If you want to know more about that, come talk to me. I will just give you this, uh, this number and then I will conclude. These are very important because they give us, uh, no, sigma, so centimeter square over gram. So by observing colliding cluster, not only we have evidence of dark matter, uh, you may know this picture, famous picture of the bullet cluster, but we also get the bound on the cross section for self interaction of dark matter by looking at what we look and comparing with hydrodynamical simulation. So this is the bound you get. So whenever you build a dark matter model, you want to make sure that the cross section for self interaction, by self interaction I mean elastic processes where cuter matter particles just collide, okay? So you want to make sure you respect this bound. And uh, tomorrow morning, we will see a few examples of thermal history, how to produce the dark matter in the early universe, keeping in mind these bounds. Whenever we build a model, we want to make sure we don't get into contradictions with this. Thanks.